Hello 6N. I am going to carry on reading our class book once. If you haven't watched my last two videos, please watch those first before you watch this one because I read two chapters that we have read in class but because it's so long ago I thought it would be good to refresh our memories. And today I'm going to start reading a chapter that we haven't yet read in class. So we're up to date, so everything I read from now on we haven't read in class. The last two chapters that I read, Zelda nearly got killed by a Nazi soldier and luckily a man called Barney saved her and Felix and took them to somewhere safe. We don't actually know where that is yet. Um, but there were lots of other children there too that had obviously been saved by Barney and they were all very intrigued about Felix's stories and Zelda really wanted Felix to tell all the children his stories because he's such a good storyteller but he he didn't want to share them he didn't feel like um, he was up to sharing them yet so Zelda started making her own stories up and we ended on a chapter with Zelda just about to start a story. We're going to be reading from page 83 today. I'm going to do it slightly differently. So instead of me just sitting here reading to you, I'm actually going to be showing the page so that you can follow on if you haven't got your own book. Okay, so you can kind of read along with me. Um, because you'll be able to see the text on the screen. Okay, so we're reading from page 83 today, and I'm only gonna read one chapter. So we're gonna be reading from 83 to 89, okay? Enjoy. Once I was living in a cellar in a Nazi city with seven other kids when I shouldn't have been. My fever has gone. I shouldn't be lying in bed. I should be out looking for mum and dad. "'Felix!' says Zelda, jumping on my sack. "'Wake up! It's time to wake up! Are you awake?' "'Yes,' I say. "'I am now.' "'You've got to get up,' says Zelda. "'You have to tell us a story.' "'I don't reply.' "'You have to,' insists Zelda. "'Barney said I'm not allowed to anymore. "'He said I start too many arguments. "'He's wrong, but that's what he said.' "'I get up. I'm desperate to pee. "'While I was sick, Barney let me pee in a bottle, "'but he must have taken it.' Where's the toilet? I say. Zelda points. Through the gloom of the cellar, I can just make out some wooden steps going up in one corner. Behind the steps is a bucket. I stagger over to it. It's half full and pongs, but I'm desperate. While I go, Zelda comes over and watches. I want to turn away, but I don't. Orphans deserve a bit of fun. Hurry up, says Zelda. We're bored. We want a story. When I've finished, I look around the cellar, but I can't see the others. There are needles of light pricking through the gloom, and I can see several sack beds, but no Barney and no other kids. Where's Barney? I say. He's out getting us food, says Zelda. Where are the other kids? I say. Zelda doesn't, repl doesn't reply. I can see she's trying not to giggle, and trying not to look at a big untidy pile of coats in the middle of the cellar. The pile of coats seem to be giggling too. Suddenly, the coats fly up into the air, huddled on the floor in a circle, are the other kids, hands over their mouths, laughing themselves silly. Well, most of them are. The wood-chewing boy is just chewing his wood. I'm not sure what's going on. It's a tent, says Zelda. A story tent. Don't you know anything? The kids are all laughing at me now. Suddenly, I feel cross. Don't you know anything? I want to yell at them. Our parents are out there in dangerous Nazi city. The Nazis are shooting people. They could be shooting our parents. A story isn't going to help. But I don't. It's not their fault. They don't understand what it feels like when you've put your mum and dad in terrible danger. When the only reason they couldn't get a visa to go to America is because when you were six, you asked the man at the visa desk if the red blotches on his face were from sticking his head in a dragon's mouth. Story, says little Henrik, clapping his hands. The others are looking up at me, hopefully. Sorry, I say. I haven't got time for a story right now. I have to go out. You can't, says Zelda. We're not allowed to. I ignore her. I look for the exit. 
The cellar has stone walls and a stone floor and no windows. The ceiling is made of wooden planks. The long needles of daylight are coming in through gaps between them. Up there must be the way out. I climb the steps. At the top is a square door in the ceiling planks. The bolt is pulled back. I push the door, but it won't open. It's locked on the other side, says the older girl with the bandaged arm. Barney locks it. I thump the door in frustration. Shh, says most of the kids. We have to be quiet, says Elder. We're hiding. Who from? I say as I come down the steps. As soon as I say it, I remember the Nazis putting kids into a truck and I know it's a stupid question. Adolf Hitler doesn't like Jewish kids, says the girl with the curly hair. Adolf Hitler? I say, surprised. Father Ludwig says Adolf Hitler is a great man. He's in charge of Poland. He's the Prime Minister or the King or something. Zelda gives me her look. Adolf Hitler, she says, is the boss of the Nazis. Don't you know anything? I stare at her. It's true, says the blinking boy, blinking harder than ever. I stare at all the kids who are all nodding. If they're right, this is incredible. I wonder if Father Ludwig has heard about this. That's why we have to hide, says the girl with the bandaged arm. All the other Jewish kids around here have been taken away by the Nazis, Adolf Hitler's orders, and they never come back. The only kids left are the ones hiding like us. Can we get on with the story now, says Zelda. I sit on the floor with them, my thoughts in a daze. Suddenly, I'm thinking about another story. The one mum and dad told me about why I had to stay at the orphanage. They said it was so I could go to school there while they travelled to fix up their business. They told it so well, that story. I believed it for three years and eight months. That story saved my life. Zelda and the others are dragging the coats over our heads and making a tent. Tell us another story about the boy in the castle, says Henrik. His name's William, says Zelda. Shh says the girl with the curly hair. She's brushing it with a hairbrush over and over, which looks pretty painful. She smiles at me. Let Felix tell us. I try to think of something to tell them, something to take our minds off our worries, something to make us forget that the most important man in the whole of Poland hates us and our parents and our books. One morning, I say, William wakes up in his castle. In his breakfast soup, he finds a magic carrot. A magic carrot, interrupts Zelda. That means he gets three wishes. It doesn't have to be three wishes, says the blinking boy. It could just be one wish. It's three, says Zelda indignantly. If he holds the carrot right. I sigh. I'm not in a story mood. My brain is buzzing with too many other things. Look, I say, let's not have another fight. Why doesn't everybody just take it in turns to say what they'd wish for if they had a magic carrot? I'd wish for my mummy and daddy, says Zelda, three times. Apart from parents, says the girl with the bandaged arm. Everyone frowns and thinks hard. Tidy hair, says the girl with curly hair, still brushing it non-stop. Your hair is tidy, Ruth, says the girl with the bandaged arm. You've got lovely hair. Ruth gives a little smile, but carries on brushing. What about you, Jacob? Says the girl with the bandaged arm to the blinking boy. Jacob blinks hard. My dog, he says. Me too, says Henrik, and my grandma's dog. The girl with the bandaged arm gives the toddler a cuddle. What would you like, Janek? Carrot, says the toddler. Everyone laughs. I'd wish to be alive, says the girl with the bandaged arm. Everyone laughs again, except me and the wood chewing boy. I don't get it. Her name's Chaya, says Ruth, still brushing. It means alive in Hebrew. Your turn, says Chaya to me. I can't think of anything except for mum and dad, and wishing Zelda's parents were still alive. But I can't say that either. I signal to the wood chewing boy to have his go. He doesn't reply. He doesn't even look at me. He just keeps on chewing the end of the piece of wood in his hands. You'd like the rest of your house, eh, Mosh? says Chaya gently. Mosh nods as he chews, not looking up. Come on, Felix, says Zelda. You have to have your turn. Use your imagination. 
I'll wait for my imagination to come up with something. Anything. It doesn't. All I can think of is that if Adolf Hitler hates Jewish kids, perhaps God and Jesus and the Virgin Mary and the Pope do too. He's not going to tell us, says Ruth. Come on, says Henrik. Let's have a lice hunt. The kids throw the coats off and go and sit in the needles of daylight and start searching through each other's hair and clothes. All except Zelda. You're mean, she says to me. Sorry, I say. I flop down on my bed. My imagination doesn't want to be bothered with stories. Not now. All it wants to do is plan how I'm going to get out of this place and find mum and dad before Adolf Hitler's Nazis kill them. Okay, so that is the end of the chapter. I thought it was quite an important chapter, actually. Even though not a lot happened, we learned a lot about the people who Barney is um, who Barney has saved and who Felix is staying with. And we found out a lot of their names. And I am sorry if I pronounce any of those names incorrectly. Um, we also found about found out about the room which they're staying in, which isn't a lovely, comfortable house. It's just a room with no windows or no doors. And Felix actually found out how dangerous Hitler actually is and how much danger he is in, Zelda's in, all of the other children that he's staying with is in, and also his parents. And I think he's more determined than ever now to find his parents. So hopefully you'll tune in next week and you'll find out with me if Felix does manage to leave where he is to go and find his parents and whether Zelda goes with him or any of the other children or even Barney. I hope you like the new layout of being able to follow the text as I read it. I'm going to keep on doing that now so from now on you're going to be able to read the text with me. And I hope you tune in next week. Bye.